Um, I, I like this new habit that's developed. But possibly it's because we're now available on WhatsApp. But uh, there's some funny comments arriving in the studio before I've even drawn breath. Alan is up first. He's, I can't believe you just called the, ca- the cabinet a talent puddle. Surely it's more of a talent damp patch. I quite like that. Um, uh, and uh, Matt reminds us, I presume that this is in response to Andrea Leadsom speaking earlier. Uh, so now the House of Lords have joined the ranks of the enemies of the British people. Uh, um, yeah, it, uh, well, uh, oddly, it's people with poor mental health or anxiety that are being added to the list of enemies of British people today by another member of Rishi Sunak's government. Um, I refer to a, a, a sad article which appears under the headline, Mental Health Culture Has Gone Too Far, which which is such a stupid thing to say. I, I mean, he may not have written the headline, but he's been speaking to the Daily Telegraph. This is the Work and Pension Secretary, someone called Mel Stride, who, if he walked into the room right now, I'd probably wonder where my tea was. I, I, I mean, if he walked into the room, if you showed me a photograph of him now, I wouldn't know him from Adam, but that is the nature of the dog days of any administration isn't it? The, if you suffer from anxiety, if you suffer from poor mental health, then it's the Work and Pension Secretary who's dedicated his dubious talents this morning to making you feel even worse and making you feel even more anxious and making you feel even less likely to be able to get it together and, and, and hit the road this morning. Um, he, he claims that normal anxieties of life are being labelled as illnesses. And there is a, a, a sort of growing narrative that this is going to be the Tories' response to a problem, is to deny that the problem exists. What has happened in the last few months is actually extraordinary. Things that aren't really massive problems or things that could be fixed, they haven't fixed. For example, the asylum system, which they have, I think, quite possibly deliberately made immeasurably worse so that they can somehow cast themselves as the people best qualified to fix it. And then, because they're as incompetent as they are dishonest, fail to fix it to the point where this Rwanda story now, even if you're racist, I bet you're bored of the Rwanda story, aren't you? Is there a phone in there? Are you a racist who's bored with the Rwanda story? Give me a call on 0345 6060 So, and, and then the problems that they can't fix or won't fix, they just deny it exist. They deny that they're problems at all. And that, I think, is what they're doing with the, with the adult equivalent of something that we touched on yesterday. Uh, thanks to David, who, who has added to the list of amusing comments coming in uh, before it's even ten past ten. I wouldn't know him if he fell in my soup, is the Scottish phrase for a person like Mel Stride. I wouldn't know him if he fell in my soup. I like that. But listen, we have to, because we're grown-ups, we, we have to uh, engage... It, with the possibility that he has at least half a point. Uh, 150,000 people are currently signed off work with mild conditions, and he is going to force them, encourage them, help them to look for a job. And and we need to begin, I suppose, by wondering how plausible the existence of these people is and then what kind of help they most need. So what I want you to tell me is really what what happens or why you're not working. I, I, listen, the problem I've got is A, believing that people are really going to choose a life of indolence for the sake of £390 a month on top of some of the most basic welfare payouts in the um, civilised world and you are removed from the requirement to prepare for a return to work. I, in all the years that I've been doing this job, that one of the things I found hardest to understand is the determination. And sometimes I get bored, by the way, of having always to use phrases like right wing. But it is always right wing people who are absolutely determined that everybody else is on the sky or on the lamb. You get these mad moments where the fraudulence is revealed in all its disgusting glory. For example, people who don't believe in poverty, but do believe that parents who might struggle to find a few extra quid to pay their school fees are victims of a terrible discriminatory conspiracy. I I don't know how bent you need to be to care not a jot 
for people who can't feed their children, but to somehow crusade as a champion of people who claim they may not be able to continue to send their children to incredibly privileged schools. I, I, that, that is just a, a moral dimension that I lack the capacity to understand. And it goes hand in hand with this belief that anybody who is in receipt of help is somehow dishonest or is somehow uh, lying. Here is a person who needs help. And I think part of the problem, I think part of the problem, there's a, I mean, the single most ridiculous contributor to public discourse. And my God, that's a crowded field. It's a bloke who writes for the Daily Telegraph called, called Alistair Heath. Uh, the headlines on his articles, I swear to God, you have to double check they're real because you think they've been generated by a sort of parody AI. And these people need to believe that they have written, risen to positions of prominence through merit and talent. And they haven't. Uh, you know, it ties back to private school. The privilege is, is extraordinary, which probably something we'll touch on when we get onto the Garrett Club in a moment, but in an hour or so. But the idea that if you have benefited from extraordinary privilege and done all right, you have to persuade yourself that it's a consequence of your talents. I think a corollary of that is the belief that people who have struggled and people who are struggling and people who need help, then they are there through their own fault as well. I, I, I know this sounds a little bit... Um, Un, unthought through, but it, I think it's true. I try to understand the mindset of people whose opinions I find repellent, and I, and I make no apology. I'm sure they're lovely people in many, many ways, but these particular opinions I find repellent. Taking aim at people who suffer with anxiety to a point where they feel they can't work, presuming that if you can find one person swinging the lead, that's evidence that everybody is. That, that position is so repellent, I try and dig into the psychology of it, and all I can ever come up with is that these profoundly mediocre people who have benefited from a country built on deference and, and privilege have somehow developed a twin necessity to persuade themselves, A, that they've ended up in the cabinet because they're talented. I, Jonathan Gullis must look in the mirror and think that he is in the House of Commons as a consequence of God-given talents, as opposed to the complete corruption of our politics undertaken by Brexit and Boris Johnson. It's a madness to think that these people stroll around Westminster feeling like masters of the universe. But if you have to convince so deep down in your belly, you know that you are... I'm not very bright, not very talented, you don't understand things, you're not very good at much, you've risen without trace because nobody really wants to go into the Conservative Party anymore. So, frankly, a, a gerbil could probably get a job in the Cabinet. Nadine Dorries can be Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. So somewhere inside, the reality festers, the knowledge... The, the, the days of high office being held by uh, gargantuan talents like Ken Clark. Those days are decades behind us. The absolute flotsam and jetsam that populates the cabinet now has to put immense amounts of effort into persuading themselves that they're not flotsam and jetsam. And if you've persuaded yourself that you are talented, you are a beneficiary of a meritocracy. You have risen through gifts as opposed to dumb luck and patronage and privilege. Then I think you also have to develop a, a, a kind of contempt for people who've fallen through the cracks. You can never admit to yourself that but for the grace of God, you'd be signed off work with anxiety. But you're not because you've risen without trace due to dumb luck patronage and privilege. And that, I think, is part of the problem I have with these stories. So this stride character says, as a culture, we seem to have forgotten that work is good for mental health. Who's forgotten that work is good for mental health? Put your hands up if you've forgotten that work is good for your mental health. That, that activity, that getting out and about is good for your mental health. Put, please, hands up now. Anyone who's... For, this, this man is the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Hey, the most senior political position in the country when it comes to matters of employment. And he's talking through his bottom. It's just gibberish. But presumably the Daily Telegraph have convinced him that there's a crowd that wants to hear this bilge. While I'm grateful to today's much more open approach to mental health, there is a danger that this has gone too far. What's gone too far? You absolute polo. What's gone too far? Uh, uh, caring, c treating, diagnosing... 
recognising, describing, accommodating. I'll tell you the problem with mental health in this country, Mel Stride, it hasn't gone anywhere near far enough because the effort that is needed to actually improve people's existences, to look after them, to help them get back into the uh, quotidian existence which would make them feel better, is non-existent. And guess whose job it is? Guess whose job it is to fix that stuff? Yeah, it's your job, you prune. It's, it's literally your job to create a society in which people suffering from anxiety stop suffering from anxiety. And you're trying to create a, soci a society in which people suffering from anxiety get told to pull their socks up, toughen up, and it's all gone too far. I didn't realise I was as angry about that as I am, and I don't know why, because I have really nothing in this game, no skin in this game at all, except you. Except the messages I have received and the calls I have taken over 20 years from people who are sick to the eye teeth of being told that they've chosen to be in the state of unhappiness that they find themselves in, that they've chosen to be in the state of vulnerability, that they've somehow signed up, signed up to be um, unhappy, to be anxious, to be depressed. They've, they've opted for it, given a, a, like a chocolate box of lifestyle choices. They've elected this one. You show me an, anx an, an, an anxious person that doesn't want to be better, and I'll show you probably a liar. It's coming up to quarter past ten. So, what's it like? What's it like? What's it like to, to, to go to the doctors? Well, here's what he claims, all right? You go to the doctors and you say, I'm feeling a bit down. And the doctor, in 94% of occasions, will sign you off work. This is, this is what the Work and Pension Secretary is claiming. So you go and see the doctor. You're not even asking to be signed off work. You're just hoping that he might be able to give you some advice, possibly some medication, some sort of therapy, or refer you for some treatment. But guess what? He can't. She can't refer you for that because the NHS has been brought to its knees by 14 years of austerity. So you go to the doctor hoping for some help. Uh, Tories have taken away the doctor's ability to give you anything like the help that you might need. And instead, in some cases, they might sign you off work, in which case Mel Stride pops up and goes, well, that's not good enough. You should be going to work. Doesn't think to address the failures that the NHS has had thrust upon it. Doesn't think to actually make announcements about fixing the poor provision for mental health. The fact that you can barely get a referral unless you're actively suicidal. The fact that you can't actually see anybody who might be able to uh, provide you with the therapy that you need. The fact that unless you can afford to pay for it privately, you can't even get close to the sort of experiences and treatments that will help you get back to work. No. None of that. Not doing any of that. We're just going to start hitting you over the head with newspaper headlines and ludicrous speeches, casting you as chancers and liars and cheats. So tell me what you really are. 0345 606 Some people's work can, of course, be the cause of their anxiety, the cause of their mental health. I was reading a very, very poignant thread the other evening from someone I know outside of social media describing the uh, almost impossible task of keeping his bosses happy. Just one of those employers who seems to revel in diminishing and belittling staff. Uh, and somehow Mel Stride thinks that going to work for someone like that is easy for people who suffer from anxiety or preferable from not going to work for So I just find the disconnect between observable reality and political rhetoric. Sometimes I, I'm almost relieved that I'm still honest enough to feel genuine fury at this stuff. And do you know what the worst thing about this is? You do, actually. You might not remember, but you do know what the worst thing about this is. The worst thing about this is I told you it was going to happen. The worst thing about this is that I told you when they'd absolutely ballsed up Brexit and they'd lost the ability to blame everything on immigration, they'd have to find somebody new to scapegoat for the failures that they've inflicted on the country. They'd have to find some new victims of austerity to blame for the consequence of, consequences of austerity. And here it is. And here it is. If you want to address the high levels of anxiety and mental health conditions in this country, you need to treat people and look after them.
You do not need to tell them that mental health culture has gone too far. You do not need to tell them that they must pull their socks up and stiffen their sinews and get themselves back into the environments that they temporarily find unbearable. If you want to address the epidemic of mental health problems that have been caused in large part by the state of our society, then you have to set about improving the state of our society. And guess whose job that is? I'll give you a clue. It's not mine. Why do you think these vampires queue up to complain and claim that we need a smaller state? Why? How can you possibly claim that we need a smaller state when you're acknowledging the existence of hundreds of thousands of people who desperately need more help? Well, the answer to that question is simple. You acknowledge the existence of hundreds of thousands of people who desperately need more help by claiming that they don't need more help, that they're getting too much help already. And it's just disgusting. And it's taken me, what time did we come on? Three minutes past? It's taken me 16 minutes to dismantle this disgusting rhetoric with absolute ease. Absolute ease. So why doesn't anybody else bother trying to do so? Answer, because they don't care about you. They don't care. They don't want to believe you. They don't care whether or not you've got anxiety. They don't care about the reality of your existence. They could just have got, only got two gears. You've got forward and reverse. That's it. They're the only gears you've got. So here is somebody I don't really understand, so I'm going to attack them. 